You know, there are a lot of people who think that any purpose in life we have to decide for ourselves. We do it all ourselves, right? And that's why, as it's been said, most people live lives of quiet desperation. They figured that there's nothing else, there's nothing. It's just what we have, and that's why people pursue money and fame and, and popularity, because they think that that's what it's all about. And it's not what it's all about. What it's about is realizing that we are not our own. We belong to somebody. But there are two masters, folks. One of them is called Beelzebub, and the other one's called Christ. You are not your own master. You never were your own master. You just thought you were. But if you're smart, you get a few years under your belt, and you find out that it's true. I'm not my own. But what I have is this tremendous opportunity to choose my master. One of those masters will tell you that you can have anything you want. And he'll work with you to defeat you, yeah. The other one, the other one says, this is just the beginning for you. Your real, your real life is waiting for you. One of them wants you to die for him. The other one died for you. Amen. What a difference, eh? Yeah, one wants to enslave you. The other one wants to set you free. But, you know, there's no such thing as true freedom. True freedom is being in servitude to Christ. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Sounds contradictory but it's not. Now, you know, I haven't got in my sermon yet, but I'll tell you what. It's important that we understand a few things. That the, the world is not our home. It's like a garden that we've been planted in. And if you let the weeds just snuff you out, then there's nothing really worth waiting for. But if you allow the, the fertilization of the Holy Spirit, the light, yes, the light bringing nourishment to you, then you'll grow up into what you were designed to be in the first place. And everybody was designed to be the same thing. Everybody. But we are nothing but potential until we accept what has been given to us. If we reject what's been given to us, right, you know, choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Well, today I want to talk about, talk about Christian judgment. Christian judgment. This is a tough topic. It's a subject that has been a source of a lot of confusion. There are two concepts that must be understood in order to remove the confusion. One is conviction and it's an awesome an awesomeness of guilt that leads to repentance to be convicted is to be filled with guilt that leads to repentance now if it doesn't in the absence of guilt there is no repentance folks you all know that right if you don't know you've broken the law you can't be sorry for it am i right the other one is condemnation, and condemnation leads to destruction. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that guilt and condemnation run hand in hand. Not true. Not true. Guilt does not have to result in condemnation, folks. Doesn't have to result in condemnation. So try to remember this distinction as we go through this. And I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can, because uh, we're starting a little bit later than I hoped for. Um, so I'm going to shorten things up a little bit here, I, I hope. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 
Exodus 24, verse 3. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. Now in Exodus 24, verse 7, Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. God spoke and the people of God heard him and they responded to what he said. They received what he said, right? When they responded to God's words, they became responsible to act as they indicated. Is that right? They said, we will do what you do, what you say, Lord. But did they? Did they? We as the people of God continue to be responsible for those things that our Heavenly Father has made known to us through His Word. Isn't that the truth? We have been instructed in righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is God's holy viewpoint, which really resu results in morality according to God, not according to culture. Right? Because different cultures have different moralities. What is good in one culture is evil in another culture, right? But there is one overriding reality, and that's God, right? So we need to follow what God says. And I'll tell you what, if we had been following what God says all along, we wouldn't be in the pickle that we are today. Now I'm talking nationally, globally, the whole thing. There's been a move away from... Uh, divine instruction away from divine guidance and what's it resulted in corruption and destruction now that happens on the individual level as well as the corporate level as well as the global level now corporately it's happening within the church itself where the church bodies that have decided that uh, we'll listen to human morality instead of God's idea of morality, right? And as a result, we accept you no matter what you are. Well, you know what? You're accepted when you walk into this church to be instructed in righteousness. That's what you're accepted for. Okay? If you come in here with an attitude that uh, human opinion trumps divine viewpoint, then... You know, you can stay, you're welcome to stay, but you're not going to hear things you want to hear. What you're going to hear is what God has to say on the subject. And if everybody, including the churches, all taught that, things would be a lot different than they are. But unfortunately, most of the churches are not teaching that. Now, I shouldn't say most. A lot of them. A lot of them. A lot of them, particularly the very large churches. Why are they large? Because they resemble the world. You have so many people coming in because they resemble the world. You don't have to change. All you have to do is come and listen to a few sermons and, and maybe uh, partake of a ceremony or two, right? That's really important, right? To have a ceremony or a ritual because that's the, that's the magic. That's like magic words, you know, to get things done. But that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is realizing that there is a creator and he came to earth as one of us named Jesus and that he died in our place to pay uh, 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 for a sin that you and I never committed <laughs> but we continue to represent it. Do you understand that? We are born with a natural propensity to not honor God to be, be to resist Him, right? Well, there's a lot more to this than I can go over right now, but let it just, I'll use the old-fashioned terms. We are born sinners, folks. We are born sinners. What does that mean? It means that we are born with an attitude that's totally contrary to God's. Simple as that. But He came that we might be able to be changed. But the only way to be changed is to accept Him. Accept Him as He is. 
So we as the people of God have to maintain a divine outlook on life. You got a choice. You can maintain a divine outlook or a human outlook. And the humanistic outlook leads to communism, folks. It really does. It really does. If you, have, if you ever do a study and find out exactly what communism is, you'll find out that that is what human nature desires. And it leads to destruction. It always will. God's way sounds like it's hard. But you know what? It isn't. Is it, Greg? It is not difficult at all. You know, it's like, well, if I become a Christian, I'll have to forget about doing things that I want to do. The truth is that when Christ resides within you, you only want to do what you want to do, and you only want to do what He wants you to do, because He lives inside of you, and He has changed you. He has changed your attitude. He has changed your desires. It's like taste, you know? When I was younger, there were certain things I couldn't stand. I hated the taste. I got older, my taste changed. Right? Anyway, I'm moving far away from this, and I don't know where in the world we're going to go. <laughs> so anyway, this is <laughs> the body of Christ, the church, has become so presuming on the mercy of our loving God that many of us have substituted our own ideas of morality and righteousness in place of God's commands. This is the difference between human-centered and God-centered morality. One is dependent on culture, and the other is dependent on the Word of God. Which one will last? Only God's Word. None, none of the others. It changes. All the other stuff just corrupts itself, and it's like shooting yourself in your foot. This is the difference between human-centered and God-centered morality. One of those ideas is that we Christians are not to judge anybody or anything. You've heard that. Why? And Luke 3, 6.37, right out of the Bible, it says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. That's what we've heard, right? But you know what? You've got to read further. And that's what I'm going to do today. John 3.17 tells us that God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. But this same word also says in John 5.22, the Father judges no one, but has committed judgment, all judgment to His Son. Wait a minute. Didn't it just say that He did not come to condemn, but that the world might be saved through Him? And then suddenly it says... The Father judges no one, but committed all judgment to the Son. Wait a minute. Is the Son supposed to do or not? Here's the difference. One is the condemnation, and the other is the salvation. I hope you're seeing one to get to see. Still the confusion persists. And then you look at uh, 1 Corinthians. Corinthians 5 verses 12 to 13. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Now, we're as body of Christ, we are in the kingdom of God. We live in the world, but we are not of the world. Are you following me? Once you've accepted God on his terms, there is a supernatural change that takes place within you. Sometimes you feel it, sometimes you don't. But your activity changes, and your taste changes, and the things that you desire change. What you, what you didn't care for before now becomes very important to you. What was important to you before, now you don't want anything to do with. All right? Because there is actually a fundamental change. But because we are in the world, but no longer of the world, we have no right to judge the world. None at all. We can, we can certainly determine, you know, this is called discernment, discernment. We can discern what's good and what's right in the world. We can discern what is in agreement with God and what is not in agreement with God in the world. And get plenty of that. 
And I tell you what, you gotta, you really got to be careful when you're watching the news because it's hard not to judge. Yeah. And when I say judge, I mean, you discern absolutely. You can discern <laughs> this is dead wrong or this is dead right, you know. But we have no right to condemn, you know. Condemnation is inherent in the position that one takes, not in you who are discerning, right? You follow me? Your discernment is not to condemnation, should never be to condemnation. Even with members of the body, all right? Um, and I'm going to get to that. When you got people in your midst claim to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who are obviously not following him, but following their own lusts or desires, then you have an obligation, folk. You have an obligation to point it out to them. And I'll, I'm going to go through all this. All right. But right now, there's an apparent complexity. It's made us, it's a source of, of, of controversy, this thing about judgment within the church. For some, it has provided a justification for bigotry and even hypocrisy. Boy, is there a lot of hypocrisy or what? And where will you find it most? You will find it most in the places of power. Where's that? Entertainment. Tremendous power in entertainment. Um... Politics, government, right? Probably is the worst place for it. But uh, the education system, the power that the teachers, the educational system have over the little kids, it's outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. And, and they're quite content with their power. They have no idea where it's taken them. Oh yeah, they can repent in the last breath. But if they don't, and even if they do, they think they're going to get away with everything that they've done? No way. No way. There will come a time of recompense. There's no getting around it. There will be. You can find it even here. You know, <laughs> it's been well said. I think it was um, Benjamin Franklin, I think it was, said, three can keep a secret if two are dead. And you know what? That is absolutely true. And these knuckleheads don't realize that. And they've got all these secrets in the government that are coming out now. And they'll continue to come out because they, you, three can keep it if two are dead. Right? So they, they think that they're all right today, but what about tomorrow? And then the tomorrow after tomorrow, when they stand in front of the greatest judge of all, <laughs> the greatest judge of all is not going to say, well, you know, uh, you had it hard. And then you figured out that you get yourself a nice little niche in, in, in the government and everything will be all right. Well, you had your day and now it's over. Boy, will it be over. And I should feel sorry for them. And maybe one day I will. I'm just not there yet. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, here's an example for you of hypocrisy. John 8, verses 2 to 11. John 8, verses 2 to 11. Now, early in the morning, Jesus came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in, in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. In the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, who, 
who he who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. And again, he stooped down. That was the second time. He stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. So Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus did not condemn. It wasn't his place to condemn. And he didn't condemn. What he did was he saved and he convicted. And who did he convict? He convicted not only the woman who was guilty of adultery, he was convict convicting those who were her accusers. So just what was it that Jesus wrote in the sand that day? Because this is a big, big question all through history. What did he write? Well, you know what? I think I know. Yeah, I know. I know. I, nobody else knows, but I know. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure probably there are other, other people have known, but it's not been made public. But I'm going to make it public today. We'll get there. <laughs> probably the most prominent theory being that he wrote the names of those in the crowd who were guilty of the same sin or even worse. Right? That's the prominent view. And, you know, I can't, I can't disagree with that. But I do think that, there's, that there is something that moved them to guilt. And it, well, I don't think it was their names because he just squatted down and did something in sand, then stood up and then squatted down. I believe that he just put in the sand three Hebrew letters. And they spelled the word chenef. Chenef. Three little letters. Chenef. And chenef actually is the word for hypocrite. Hypocrite. And here's what is really interesting about it. That word is made up of chet nun peh in the Hebrew. Now, when you, if you just look at those as letters, you won't see much. But if you see them as the pictures that they each represent, pictograms, they're called uh, like hieroglyphs. What you have now is um, a fenced-in area. That's the chet. Nun is seed, like life. A sperm is the way it is in the actual uh, lettering. And uh, pe means the mouth. Well, what comes out of the mouth? Words. So if I put all that together, what it's saying is your life is bound up by what comes out of your mouth. Your life is bound up by what comes out of your mouth. Listen to Hebrews, I mean Matthew, Matthew 15, verse 11. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Now, in the Greek, the word for hypocrite is the compound of hupo, which means under, and krino, or krisis, which means judgment or condemnation. So the hypocrite is one who puts himself into judgment and condemnation. Now, isn't that what a hypocrite does? Judge not lest ye be judged, right? And the thing is that the hypocrite is all about condemnation. He wants to condemn those that don't agree with him. And so he places them under judgment unto condemnation, not 
to salvation. It's not to instruct them. It's not to save them. It's not to correct them. It's to destroy them. All right? That's the function of the hypocrite. He will accuse, he will accuse you of what he himself is doing. Right? Matthew 7, verses 2 to 5 is a verse that applies to this meaning. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck in your, from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? That kind of message of vision, doesn't it? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. First of all, notice that this is speaking of judgment or discernment with the body of Christ and not outside, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, 5, 12, which was talking about um, a man who was caught in an adulterous situation and uh, the congregation seemed to be fine with that, right? No problem. See, we have that happening now too. Uh, homosexuals in the pulpit, for example. Now look, what person's sexual taste is, is not my, that's none of my business. And I don't hate them for it. And I can understand, sex is a very, very strong, very strong uh, power in a person's life. Um, it's it's uh, an appetite that's very, very hard to deal with. I, and I understand all that. But it's not natural. No, it's natural because I have it. No, that doesn't make it naturally. It doesn't make it natural. It simply makes it the way you are. And there might be a reason for that. And I don't know whether it would be psychological or physiological or, or, or even conditional as is happening now in our education system, people are being taught to be homosexual. My God, that's ridiculous. And they're being taught that there is no difference between man and woman. It is absurd. As a matter of fact, it is so stupid, and I use that word, stupid. Unline it and put it in black. It is stupid. But you know what? It's such a threat to us all that, you know, if it wasn't so, so stupid, it would be funny. How anybody could be hooked in this stuff is beyond me. So I've got to think that it's got to be spiritual. It's got to be spiritual. There is a demonic aspect to this. There's no doubt in my mind because it makes no sense. If you have a, even a low IQ, you've got to figure this out for yourself. So people are being brainwashed. And of course they'll accuse me as being brainwashed too. But yes, I, I have been. My brain is very, very clean. <laughs> That's right. Mine, mine is clean. <laughs> you know, Jesus used, he's clean, good clean water, not the filth that is in our educational system now. And so all of culture is being affected by this. There's going to be more and more. And even the people who are uh, promoting this are going to find themselves victims along with everybody else. And that's what's so crazy about it. They have no idea that they're going to be victims just like everybody else. They think they can rise above it, but they can't. Well, just like the Hebrews who heard the commands of God and said, all that the God has said we will do and be obedient, we have they have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to preserve the truth within the body of Christ. We do. We have a responsibility. If we don't, if we don't see that there's error in our midst and correct that error, you know, make it known there is an error. Now, I don't mean go up with a, hey, look at you, what, you know. You don't do it in a militant fashion. You do it with compassion, folks. Compassion. Say, look, I've been there. I know what it's like. And I know how difficult it is. 
but it will lead you into destruction. And they need, people need to know that. If you're not going to tell them, then you know what? The guilt is on you too. Right? And the trick here, I want to shorten this as much as I can. The trick here is really to, to be compassionate about the whole thing and realize that, you know, there but for the grace of God go you or I. You know? Like, yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was an assistant pastor in a fairly large church down in Florida, and uh, there was a, a woman who, uh, everybody's accepting, fine, no problem at all, and uh, they, they all knew that she was living with her boyfriend. And what, did, what am I going to do? Uh, I went to her and I said, you know, and I showed her the scriptures, I said, this will only lead to problems. You know, that uh, I don't care that the society seems to be all right with this, but God isn't. And God's not out to get you. His purpose is to make things right for you. And I tried to explain it to her gently and with compassion. And her whole attitude was, who are you to judge me? I said, well, I've been there. I've been exactly where you are, you know. But I learned that no, nothing good came of it. So what I did was, I did what God said I should do. And I married. And when I did, things got a whole lot better. No. And why? Because God doesn't lead you into destruction. He leads you into life. If you listen to Him, then you find yourself in a joyful situation. <laughs> There's just no substitute for obedience to God. You know. People, you think that I don't want to be, well, this is obedience, I don't have to be obedient to anybody. Well, you know what? If you're not obedient to God, you're being obedient to the devil. You think, you think you're being obedient to yourself, but it's actually the devil. Because one thing that you've got, everybody's got to learn is that there are only two masters. One is light and the other is darkness. Which one do you align yourself with? It's as simple as that. It couldn't be any more simple. Question. Do I have responsibility to speak the truth in the presence of error or do I maintain my peace so as not to offend? Everybody's afraid of offense today. God. We, we are developing into... Uh, a generation of just pussy cats. That's the best I could say for it. Pussy cats. I'm so offended. You know, it's been well said offense is more taken than given. You know, you can say something that should not be offensive, but somebody is bound to take offense. And what does that speak of? It speaks of weakness. I mean, where's the strength of character, huh? Where's the strength of character? If, if, you, if you receive a correction and it causes a feeling of guilt, your response actually should be, wow, what can I do about this? No, but instead they just put a, push it aside. So often there is no feeling, feeling guilt anyway. And that what's that called? That's called repentance. That's what repentance really is. When you realize your guilt, when you realize your guilt, and that you have a need for a change, and it's only then that the change will come. You all know that, don't you? It's like until you realize you're sick, you will not take the medicine. Right? It's as simple as that. How are you going to find out you're sick? Spiritually, the only way you're going to find out is to become aware of what the truth is. Now, you can make your choice. You can either listen to Buddha 
or you can listen to, um, uh, gosh, any number of philosophers, or you can even listen to your church. This is what you listen to. It's not your church. It's not your denomination. It's not your religion. It's not your philosophy. It's not any of those things. It's the Word of God. And when you listen to the Word of God, church, religion, denomination, all of that is insignificant. Right? Because the truth is not found in church. It is not found in a denomination. It is found in the Word of God. And if your church and your denomination are based on the Word of God, really based on the Word of God, then you actually have something. Until then, you don't. Human nature is prideful. And resentment is the reaction that should be expected in the absence of correction no matter how tactfully it may be given. The most you can reasonably hope for is that the Spirit of God brings conviction and the believer sticks around long enough to receive the correction. In the absence of correction, there will be no growth. Without correction, there will not be any growth. People will stay the way they are. But correction must be given with compassion. Otherwise, it's sanctimonious. Right? You don't want sanctimonious correction. Look at me. I'm perfect. You're not. You want to be like me? you got to do this. <laughs> That's not the way to do this. And say, listen, <laughs> I was lost just like you. I just did so many things were not good, just like you. I'm no better. But it's like that song. I think, that, was it played today? Uh, I'm just a nobody yeah. seeking somebody to tell about. How's it go? I'm just, I'm a nobody looking for everybody to tell about somebody who served my, saved my soul. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the whole point here is that nobody is perfect. But we all have the potential of being far greater than we are. Amen? So that's what it's all about. Oh, Lord. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, give correction. That's what a friend would do. Somebody who agrees with your sins, they're not your friend. Amen? The Word tells us that the consequences of our actions will eventually catch up with us. But the scriptures clearly state that a timely warning will be given to a, by a friend. The truth is that judgment can issue forth from a genuine concern with the purpose of toward healing. Or it can spring forth from a search and destroy mentality driven by a desire to conquer. There is a judgment unto condemnation and there is a judgment unto salvation. One is born of arrogance or hatred and seeks to condemn. The other is born of love and concern, not just of God and of the truth, but also for the one walking in error. It is the one that speaks to save. Jesus set us the highest example of this kind of judgment. In John 8, verses 15 to 16, he said to the Jews, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. 
When Jesus corrected error, he was speaking for God from the scriptures. His judgment was accurate and righteous. But when the Jews judged, it was from the traditions and according to the outward appearance of a virtue that they hoped would conceal an interior of, of corruption and pride. You know, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. You know, they put on a show, but inwardly, they were corrupt. Jesus never judged, he never judged a condemnation. In John 12, 47 to 48, he declares, If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. What is that? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Judged by the word. Hmm. All through the Old Testament, God had his prophets proclaiming and correcting his people that it offended them. They were offended to such a degree that they stoned the, the, the prophets. The only ones that they did not stone were the false prophets because the false prophets told them what they wanted to hear, right? Same as God in some pulpits. They, you just keep being told what you want to hear. And the church gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because people are just hearing what they want to hear and everything is good and rosy and joyful and they got all these uh, programs going. And, uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 3 verses 17 to 18, God told Ezekiel, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die in his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. Is that clear? We have a responsibility to point out error. We have that responsibility. And error is whatever does not agree with God's word. Whenever the Lord judged, whether directly or through his apostles, it was either to bring about separation from the world system and unto the kingdom of God, or it was to correct destructive error as he has said through Peter in 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there, were no, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. See, false teachers among us. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them. The record of the scriptures shouts loudly, that those who would follow Jesus would take on the same burden of proclaiming and correcting that caused him to be despised and persecuted by those whom he offended. So think carefully before accusing a brother of judging. You may yourself be judging the Lord who holds us accountable to preserve the purity of his word. We can be held accountable, folks. Galatians 5.9 tells us a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. That's why it's so important that the truth proceed from the pulpits in these churches. And a lot of them it is. But if you don't know the Word of God from the Bible, you can be deceived. Rather than accusing a brother of judgment, it would be far better to consider whether or not the judgment is righteous and true. And does the judgment carry with it a blessing? That's important. Does it carry with it a blessing? Not a cursing, not a condemnation, but a blessing. Remember, there is a judgment unto condemnation and there is a judgment unto salvation. Now I'll finish with this. Second Timothy 2. 23 to 
2 Timothy 3 verse 5, it says this, Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal whisperers or despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Our job is not to condemn. Our job is to instruct. And if we receive condemnation for our instruction, so be it. Because uh, we do not answer to those who are in denial. We answer to the one who created us and then recreated us. Amen? Amen.